So you are nervous or not nervous? No. Because I'm super nervous right now. I'm not like, no. I'm no? Really. Okay. Well, I, mean, I want to more kick excited. Off. Okay, good. Anticipation, good. I guess. You watch Bill's podcast? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. I watch well, a lot of them. I think it's hilarious. JT <laughs> Tompkins, uh, absolute hammer stick, as we know. AOI 2023, Bassmaster EQs. I want to kick off this podcast reading a message you sent to me on Instagram on September 6th of last year. And I didn't know who you were. And you open it up. I was scrolling through Instagram one morning. Hey, Chris, I know you don't know me or have heard of me, but I don't know many people in the industry. I am leading the AOI points and the opens and trying to navigate the sponsorship side and the social media side of the game. And I have admired you, your abilities in that area, along with your on the water abilities. I, of course, haven't made it yet, but I don't want to be caught off guard if I do make the elites. I was wondering if you have it, if you have some time for a conversation about these topics. And here we are a couple months later. You're at my house. More We're getting than a ready. Months. Yeah, a few <laughs> months later, you're qualified. AOI and the EQs. You just picked up your boat in East Texas. You're hanging out with us here tonight on the set. And we kick off the season in like eight, nine days, dude. Mm-hmm. What's it feel like to be you? I don't know. I mean, it's it's all happened so fast. Like, even though I was trying to prepare back then, it, it's still like, even now, I feel like everything's kind of falling in. And I'm just trying to stay on top just long enough to get to this first event and get on the water. Because all of it kind of melts away once you get on the water. But right. leading up to it, it's kind of What's the hectic. craziest thing that's ha- like that you've dealt with that you haven't dealt with on the Opens? Get preparing for a season, but like with the elites that you're having to deal with. So, I mean, the number one thing that I was completely caught off guard with was the amount of responsibilities <laughs> that I would have. Like, it's it's not, I mean, it's <laughs> it's legitimately, like everybody said, it's, it's like 33% catching fish. Yeah. 66%. Like, and you haven't even started yet. Dude. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're kind of wise. I talked to you a little bit before this thing. You're kind of wise beyond your years, I could tell by just talking to you. And uh, you, you say that now, like, you... Once we like get going, oh it's like gosh. it really. It, but like we're right in the middle of it right now, right? Your your boat wrap is being applied right now by Tyler Wraps and our, mm-hmm. our friend Bobby's wrapping the boat. And he told me, <laughs> well, you told me, oh, my boat's getting wrapped, and I'm thinking, oh, you had it booked out for weeks. He told me it was an emergency boat wrap, mm-hmm. and he squeezed you in. Mm-hmm. So that just goes to show you, like it's like hectic. A lot of times the boat completion dates are pushed back and pushed back. Availabilities pushed back. And, uh, yeah, he said he had to squeeze you in. <laughs> yeah, like, I was supposed to get it wrapped when I was in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and try to get it done there. And then I didn't get my boat done at all in time with the electronics, and I rigged my boat myself mm-hmm. for the most part this nice. year. The first part of the rigging we did myself, and it took a lot longer than I was expecting. I had a lot more responsibilities I had to take care of. Yep. That took a lot of time. And I was like, okay, I got to be pre-practicing Texas. I was like, you know what? I'm going to Texas. We'll figure out a boat wrap when we get there. Yeah. Just, like, <laughs> I got to practice. This Pretty is- important piece. Yeah, we'll just wait. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out when we get down there. And I got down there. And I, I called up Skeeter. I was like, hey, I, I know y'all guys are down here. And y'all guys have a really good wrap guy that I could, like, you know, you know, shoot a call and mm-hmm. see if we can get something squeezed. He's like, yeah, we have probably one of the best rap companies in probably the, the country, mm-hmm. Tyler Rap. That's mm-hmm. true. And I called the guy super awesome you know he squeezed me in he definitely did me a huge favor like i couldn't have gotten it done without him so i really appreciate that guy for squeezing me in and i'm super excited to get it done because i've only heard like the best things about this guy so did you did he design your rap i kind of had like two different people i think he perfected it he's so good he's so good what one that their install is insane they're very Mm -hmm. meticulous but what makes them like a step above everyone else is his design eye. Most people who do raps don't have that graphic design background. Mm-hmm. And he's like the king of understanding, not just branding, but like focal points and everything. So mm-hmm. you went to the, it worked out. It, it might, worked out very yeah, well. May have been a hot mess, but you're what's better your, for what's it. What's your boat wrap design in words? I know you're going to show it on your social media, but like in words, tell them, please tell me it's the AOI trophy. And, <laughs> and I'm saying that because I also was the AOI point, points leader back then and when i finished uh first in the you know uh central opens when i qualified 2012 mm-hmm. so long ago but i got nothing i they, they gave me a pat on the back and we'll see you mm-hmm. next year all, all he had Pay was up. the only logo on his entire boat wrap was the spack skeeter that was required he didn't yeah. have anything after that yeah 
Yeah, so my rep, I actually got a logo built with my name, JT Fishing, nice. and I'm actually getting a QR code. You know, I want to get a QR code built, so if someone wants to go by my boat and they can just scan their phone on my boat and pull up all my social media and everything, yeah, like, that's a big goal that I'm working on right now, getting done, but I can just install it afterwards. But it's basically going to be all my all my sponsors this year, and then JT Fishing is going to be the main spot on it. And just, he did a great job, you know, like his, the, his visual eye when it comes to making things pop yeah. is amazing. Like he's solid. Like he was talking so far above my head when he was like, yeah, I just added this, 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 like 40 different things to make it all pop. And I was like, yeah, it yeah. looks 40 times better than what I ever dreamed it would. And I have no clue what you did, but you did it. Right. Like, That's awesome. He, so. so Chris always runs camo. And mm -hmm. there's no other camo boats that like touches because Bobby's eye, Bobby like will do li things that are little, but those little things make your, mm -hmm. your actual sponsors pop and everything blend. It's crazy. So going back to this message you sent me back on September 6th, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to navigate the sponsorship side and the social media side. Mm -hmm. How's that been going? Yeah. I mean, it was the biggest learning curve I've ever had in bass fishing was definitely social media and sponsors like mm -hmm. understanding like connections is a big thing like understanding getting in person getting getting to talk to the right person yeah was one thing that i found really difficult to handle and but like like I've, loc like finding mm -hmm. like a phone number or an email or even just who that person is at that company yeah like i spent more time trying to find who to talk to than talking to people yeah. honestly and then like my big thing this year was that I learned is working with people that like you or like you really click with. Right. Like huge. every single sponsor I have this year was probably like, it's almost like every single time I call them, mm -hmm. I'm like just shooting the breeze with them. Like I yeah. just call them just to talk to the guys. Like, yeah. and that huge. was, a, that was a big deal for me this year was yeah. having guys that I can just, you know, I'm traveling down to fork. I got a 14 hour drive. Let's just call my sponsors. Like, yeah. I don't know how many people have the luxury of doing that, but I've, I've been able to have that. Well, luxury. everyone has the luxury of doing that, but how many people take the opportunity to do that? Mm -hmm. That's a very short list, you know. Oh, yeah. And the sponsors obviously appreciate that. Oh yeah, and I'm I'm super appreciative of everyone who jumped on board with me. You know, I know it's a big risk with rookies, and I really appreciate those guys taking the risk. And it's just been a that was you know tough to get it going, but once I got it going and I got to meet the right people, it was a, a very enjoyable experience and the social media is still tough for me because yeah you know for the last three years i've just been back in the boat go fishing, fishing don't worry about a single thing yeah and then now like i remember i was at fork and mike Aganelli was at the boat ramp and i was pre-practicing i get down a boat ramp i was like i back in my boat power pole down at the dock i'm like mike can you watch my <laughs> boat for like five minutes i gotta go grab my camera because i can't <laughs> i can't not record and i drove down there he's still sitting there back in his boat i'm like dude thank you so much i gotta go and i was <laughs> off on the water you know <laughs> setting up my cameras like it's it's such a it was so many responsibilities i had to learn with between cameras you know ac acknowledging huge. the camera huge and a lot of that's the, all the little things like you were saying like it's not just the little things in wrapping it's the little things in every avenue of life and i'm learning that's the most important things yeah, yeah. and that was super interesting to learn and I feel like it's going to make me a better angler mm -hmm. as well, learning how to more delegate value. so many different things. You will so have more value, yes. You're mm -hmm. so young, and you're talking so well right now. I'm yeah. kind of floored, to be honest. <laughs> like, I didn't expect that. I didn't know what to expect from you. Um, can you tell everyone how old you are? Because I just learned, and I was like, no way. I turned 22 January 15th. So, you, so yeah, I was reading your bio. So 22 years old and height, 6 foot 2, weight, 125. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah, just about yeah. Six two. Yeah, I wish. I no, wish I was no. The reason why you're sitting there is because at the classic, I could, we had a little chat at the classic last year, and like we saw eye to eye, a couple short dudes. Like we got to <laughs> stick together. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean like definitely one of those guys, like, five foot two. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty easy to not really stand out, but you know, stand yeah. down. It's easy. Everyone knows exactly. When you adjust your trolling motor, I mean, you're like putting it, like pushing it up here, the head of it up here. That's Chris, awesome. You, Chris. Chris is it's the only too. time I could rip short jokes because I get them all my life. Like, oh, uh, like, yeah. dude, I remember I love like reading comments on Instagram. Yeah. Like, someone would be like, "Can he see over the head of his trolling?" Motor? Like, <laughs> sometimes I really can't. Like, if I'm fishing, if I'm fishing bushes, I run a 52 inch trolling motor, you know, oh, the wow. Ultrax, and that thing sticks up like high. I'm like, I'm having to peek over it sometimes. <laughs> you know, my graphs. I mean, driving a lake, my my skeeter. You know, I was actually I had to lift my seat up like two inches, put starboard underneath my seat. Right. Did you yeah. really? I see yeah. yeah. He was sitting in my boat. There's two inches of starboard underneath my seat that I drilled in. And that's amazing. Oh, every boat, it's either it's either that or sit on a throw cushion. 
Yeah, so, true. I've sat man, on a cushion before. That's that a, yeah, that's I've sat a, on a cushion for like four years straight. It don't bother me. That's at all. probably a, a boat mod that uh, I probably wouldn't talk about, but that just that just shows your character right there. Right? Yeah, it's oh awesome, well. open and honest. We love it here mm-hmm. so, on the Bilge Podcast. So you're 22, just turned 22. How? Because I remember the last open I fished was in 21. It was um, St. Lawrence. Yeah, I remember. When's mm-hmm. the first open that you fished? How old were you? Wow, that was actually a tough one. So the first open I fished, it was the Bassmaster Open at Harris Chain in when I was 18 years old. And I remember it because it was the worst finish of my career. Were you a boater? I was a boater. What was your finish, do you remember? Like 218th. And that was like... I was probably right below you, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't think anyone was below me that tournament. But the, that was what started... That was probably the most important tournament of my career because the next tournament was on Harris Chain, the Toyota series that I won as a boater. Oh, did you win that one? I mm-hmm. didn't know that. So you went from your worst finish to your to winning. Like Yeah. That. So that was probably like like my most important tournament of my life was that Bassmaster Open because I remember saying in my mind, like, I cannot start the year off on a bad finish. Right. And I said, you know what, there's another Toyota series at um Harris Chain in two weeks. I'm not leaving. Okay. And I stayed there and I fished it. So at 18, starting as a boater and open, that's huge. Mm-hmm. What did you do before that? Were you in still in high school at that point? I was in high school, but I went to a private Christian school in my hometown, and I had a lot of leeway with leaving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I actually started fishing boater on the FLW. I started fishing boater in Toyota Series, BFLs, and all sorts of stuff. And that's how I kind of got my start was fishing that stuff. But my dad fished the FLW Tour as well, uh-huh. and I, I did co-angler. What's your dad's name? Timmy Tompkins. Timmy Tompkins. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So he fished boater and I traveled around the country and followed him around as nice. a co-angler. So when did you start that? How old were you? When 16. You, 16. I fished the first tournament the day of my birthday. Like I literally had to sign the waiver. I was 15 years old and I remember I couldn't sign it the day of the meeting because I had to go the next morning, find Bill Taylor, sign the waiver. Because you were finally 16. Because I was finally 16 that morning at Okeechobee. Wow. So we ask a lot of veterans on on this set, you know, whether it's Rick Klon, Matt Heron, we ask them a lot, you know, would you, with as tough as it is to make a living professional bass fishing, sounds like your dad has had an awesome career. You know, if we were to ask your dad, you know, would you recommend being a professional bass fisherman to your, your son or daughter? And nine out of 10 times, these veterans will say, no. absolutely not. But you are, you are that like one, two, 3%. Where it's like, no, I'm set up to do this and I'm going to mm-hmm. get after it. Yeah, I've been given an opportunity that not a lot of people have been given. Yeah. And I understand that. Yeah. My dad, my parents, you know, my mom and my dad, they give me an opportunity that not many people are, awesome. that have available to them. Yeah. And I under, I try to keep that in mind and I yeah. try to, you know, represent that as best as I can. Yeah. And, you know, financially they've helped me. Absolutely. My entire career. Yeah. And they've allowed me to, you know, like, like my big motto is, is practicing. Mm -hmm. Like, like everyone knows that I practice months and months and months and months. And they've allowed me to do that. And I've heard that about you. Yeah. Yeah. You do a lot of mm pre-practicing. Yeah. I do a lot of pre-practicing, but also like I've always, my dad has always told me like, if you're going to have this opportunity, make the most of it. Yeah. Like, like honestly, he always said, if you outwork every single person beside you, you will make it. Absolutely. So has he put like, so when you turned 18, you signed up for that first open. Did he, did your parents put like stipulations? Like if we're going to support this career, then you have this timeline to make it or you have, or did they like put conditions on it? Like, was it like, okay, you're not going to college. This is what you're doing, but you've only got four years to get it done. I don't think there was a time stipulation. It was more of a, my dad is very good at seeing things in people. Mm -hmm. Like I've noticed that like he sees things long, long, long time before anybody else. That's how my wife is. And like when it comes to businesses, when it comes to every avenue of his life, he's been able to dissect things way faster than most people around him. And like he, he basically told me, he says, I can tell if you're working hard. Yeah. And I remember he would say, I know if you're deserving of it, you know, as we would go, you know, he would push me. Like I remember like he would wake up every morning I woke up and I was pre practicing, he would be up at the same time I was. Even though he wasn't practicing, he would be yeah. home in bed. And I remember like those days, I mean, every eighteen year old or sixteen year old, they get lazy. Yeah. Like I was I was just as lazy as probably most kids, but my parents pushed me so hard. I remember waking awesome. up and he would have find my friends and I remember at six thirty in the morning, he multiple did. times he'd be calling me saying, 
hey, why aren't you on the water? Get out there now. That like, is awesome. I'm like, yep. Holding and, you accountable. Yeah, he yeah. held me accountable. And, you know, of course, like every other kid, you know, I didn't like it. Yeah. But I grew to love it. Yeah. You and, had an, a huge opportunity. Yeah. And then now, like, it doesn't have to. His, he never has to do that again. He trusts yeah. me 100% that I'm going to be working as hard as I possibly can at that time. That's yeah. impressive. And, you know, for and not only did he support me financially, because, like, it, anybody can be supported financially and not make it. Right. He supported me mentally in every single way that he possibly could, along with my mom. Yeah. You know, they were both so supportive of everything, and that's the only reason I'm here today. That was is because awesome. of that. That's and cool. I really appreciate everything they've done for me so far. That's, that's legit, really cool. dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a hell of an opportunity. Yeah, that's great. I mean, but you got to work hard. Like they, yeah. they can yeah. only they can only take you so far, right? I mean, you got to bust. You know how many times, like my first year, second year, going to my third year, how many times I had to call home and say, "Hey, Dad, mm-hmm. can I get a couple grand to get me to the next through to the next tournament Absolutely. and everything." And he would invest that knowing like I'm out there busting my ass, like trying to make it mm-hmm. and go, and I'm going to make it, you know, and exactly that's you special. gotta, that you gotta is, have that mentality that's like, special yeah you yeah. gotta have the mentality of it's gonna happen mm-hmm. no matter what i have to do i will make it happen yeah. and also the other mentality that i tell people like you hey you like one of my favorite things is what brandon polonick said he says I, I believe pretty sure this is almost word for word was you can't just like fishing you can't love fishing mm-hmm. you gotta be able to not live without it mm-hmm. yeah. and then you might just have a shot yep that's true and that was probably one of the most profound things i've heard from an angler like, and I remember, like you were just saying a minute ago, like a lot of people don't recommend fishing to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And that is so true. Cause like I, I've stayed at, you know, some people's houses and they have kids and they're like, Hey, you know, what would you say to our kid? And do you think he can make it and all this stuff? I'm like, I was like, honestly, fishing is the worst thing yeah. ever. Yeah. I says, it's terrible. Yeah. Like, unless you think, unless he cannot live without it. Yep. Yeah. And he has more drive for that than anything else in his life. He might just have a shot. Yeah, that's true. And they asked me like, so like they they're floored by it usually. Like you don't love it. I was like, I was like, I love it. Mm-hmm. I I probably can't live without it more than I love it. Like I hate it probably more than I'd love it <laughs> at the same time. But I can't live without it. And like that is such an interesting thing that I tell people and they just don't understand is right. like, there's not there, number one. There's not a ton of money in fishing, None. and there's not a ton of opportunity. Yeah. And it's hard to work extremely hard for such little return, and that's the pe- that's what people don't understand. Yeah, and if that's what I try to tell yeah, people. Yeah, if you don't love it, like well, that's the thing. The mm-hmm. reward has got to be inside of you. you yeah, know, it not can't a be monetary money. thing. It it's Cause there's sponsors no logos. Money-wise. Forget that. It's got to be within you, like achieving yeah. those goals within you. And yeah, I remember you know traveling from California to Texas and back, California, Oklahoma, back, California uh to arkansas and back it's like i was making 24 26 hour drives mm-hmm. like dedicated to to you know achieve this one goal and and um you know everyone has their their different paths right i mean there's no path that's the same but all of us share that same hard working work yeah. ethic and uh and that's the only way you're going to stay around i mean in our rookie class i think there's only i think there was 12 of us and how many qualified this year is nine. it nine nine yeah so you know, I've been in it 13 years and there's only what two of us left. So 13 years from now, I mean, mm-hmm. you're going to be the only guy left for them. I mean, a couple of you are going to be the only two dudes left in your rookie class. And, um, yeah, just boils down to, to hard work. You got to love it for sure. Mm-hmm. So, um, you, your first open was at 18. Um, so that means it only took you three years to get qualified, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say is the secret sauce in the opens? Like what, what would you say, like, because the to me, the open, seeing what he does on the elites and seeing what I learned in the opens, they're like different formulas. Mm-hmm. Do you think that they're different formulas and, and what's the opens formula? So I think the elites is a completely different strategy strategy compared to the opens. That's what I've been trying to learn these last few months. It's, it's not the same. Mm-hmm. Like in the opens, it's not as like in the elites, you have to find fish that are you have to find tournament winning fish every single tournament and then catch them. The opens you can get away with if you're a really good angler, you're really good with live scope, whatever. Maybe you can get away without fishing people and and scrambling by. You know, right. there's a lot of people just being consistent. Being consistent. Yep. There you go. Yep. And like you can fish like a lot of tournaments. People do good release fish fishing. Mm-hmm. You know, 
scrambling those 12 to 14 pound bags yeah. over and over and over and over. Like under being a professional at catching those average size bags for every lake. Because the thing is when you have that many boats and you're still able to catch that average size bag, it, it shows. Yeah. But the thing is in the elites, you have to be straight up on them every single day of the year. You'll and that's see, what people dude. don't understand. You'll see like, okay, we're getting ready to hit Toledo Bend next week. And the very week after Lake Fork, Mark my words. Remember, I said this. You're gonna go out there within. Let's call it six competition days. Like you're, you know, I'm gonna bet you're gonna make the cut on on uh, on each Saturday. So we'll call it six days at you know three three over here and three over here. Hopefully, you make a championship Sunday. Um, mark my words. You're gonna feel like you absolutely crushed them one of those six days. Like crushed them. Oh, I'm mm-hmm. gonna be in the top three. You're gonna be like in fifteenth place. Yep. Like it is. It is. It, it's it, it, different world. It'll throw you off. It'll throw you off your game. You're like, wow. Okay, I thought I smashed them today. How the heck am I gonna smash them tomorrow? If I thought that was good, you know. Yep. It's uh, it's eye opening, dude. It really is. And I mean, don't get me wrong. Those opens, those guys you qualified with last year. Oh my gosh, they're absolute hammer sticks mm-hmm. as well. But it is a different. It's a whole different thing. Two hundred boat fields, right? Ex- you know, longer p- practice periods. Yep. Um, being consistent is the biggest thing, and you did it last year in what nine nine tournaments? Mm-hmm. That's a lot. Oh, it was a marathon. Like it's it a just, lot. It just drug on and on and on and on. Especially, I didn't like the year was flying by. Then all of a sudden, I got in the lead at Saint Lawrence River, yeah. and then those next three tournaments, I swear there was a year in between them. Like <laughs> yeah. it had to be at least nine months in between each tournament. When it was realistically only like three weeks, but yeah. like. It felt like I was just dragging on did and on. Your first two years in the opens, did you come close? I missed it by one spot two years in a row. Really? Really? Mm-hmm. Did you really? Yep. In the Northerns both times. Right there with Sam then. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Sam George. Wow. I didn't know that. I didn't even weigh in a limit one time oh. on the last day. So you know, like, so Carl one time, mm-hmm. he almost made it. And he, I remember back then he could say, I know the one fish that I lost mm-hmm. that would have qualified me. Yep, and there's a picture on Bassmaster of me losing four fish that day. On, <laughs> you can see my jig here and my jerk bait here, and it's like a three pound smallmouth here, and I weighed in four fish that day because I had a big bag on day one. Uh-huh. And I don't know if it was the pressure or what, but I remember it was Oneida, and yeah. I lost like four three pounders and didn't even. I, I weighed in, I weighed in four fish that day, and wow. I lost like four three pounders like on camera, like everything. It was. Like a very disheartening realization. I was like, wow. But it was the best thing that ever could have happened to me as well. At the same time, it was the year before that and in the next year was the biggest, best thing that could ever happen was not making it because yeah. I learned so much about people and sponsors and, and fishing all together in those next two years that it, it made me who I am today and made me a lot more prepared for the future. So. I don't ask a lot of fishing questions on on the build here, but what mm-hmm. what is what is JT's specialty? What what is your go to? Give me your first and second go to. What when we launch a boat? At, when you launch a boat at Toledo Bend, what are we checking first? See, I can't because you know because you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about, right? So yeah, there's there's, sure. there's the thing that that should be the deal, and anglers talk about oh the trap and gra- the red trap and grass that should be the deal, and then there's this thing. Oh my gosh! I gotta go throw a swim bait on main lake points. Like that. That's my. That's mm-hmm. my sauce. What? What's the sauce? So for JT. My, the bad thing is I grew up on Winyaw Bay. <laughs> Ar- arguably, oh my gosh. arguably one of the worst fisheries in the industry. Yeah. In like ever. Yeah. But like, my strength is tidal water, shallow water nice, fishing. Nice. Like dude, I same. grew. I grew up in a fourteen foot. That's what I fished out of my whole entire life. Yeah. Just about. I fished out of a fourteen foot with a forty Yamaha with a tiller handle. And ran up rivers. Power jumping, fishing. Yeah, jumping sandbars, jumping logs. Wow. My whole entire life. That's all we did. And throwing top water in, yep. in little rivers with like four mile an hour current every day of my life. So nice. that's why like if I had to pick a strength, that if I get around tidal waters yep. and I get like, I guess like I got three strengths that I, I historically have done well with. It is tidal waters. Yep. I've always succeeded in tidal waters. And then chatterbaits. With grass, usually hydrilla, yep. eel grass, anything like that, and then my most common one now is a jerk bait with live scope. Yeah, and I just I don't know I I just feel super confident with it. There's yep. a lot of things you can do with it. Yep, There's shallow, like, deep, hundred different yeah. jerk baits yep. you can throw. You can weight them, put big hooks. Yep. You can put float on the back of it, make yep. it float. Like yep. there's a hundred things you can do. with How it. How long have you been live scoping? Did you get on it immediately? Um, no, not not really. So I remember. 
I fished a BFL on Lanier, a BFL Super Turner on Lanier when I was 18 years old, I think. And I remember me and my dad were, I was like telling him, dad, like, look at these Scott Martin videos. We yeah, on, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was on Smith Lake and he, he had this old transducer and he's like, man, look at Pan this optics. fish like 60 feet away from me. Yeah. And throws like a spy bit or something and catches him. I was like, this is the most amazing thing in the world. I was like, oh, that's just. See, there's a difference right there. The younger mm-hmm. guys. And first of all, the stereotype is all nine of you that qualified this year. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're all live scopers. Oh, they're they're all kids. They all love their electronics. Doesn't seem like that's the case. But I will say, you said you watched Scott Martin's videos. You know the old Panoptics five years ago, six yeah. years or whatever it was. Six. And you were like, oh my gosh, I got that's the coolest thing ever. Mm-hmm. Where a lot of dudes who have been in it forever just to watch sell those. Products. Yeah, watch those same. Scott Martin videos, or maybe have seen that, you know, five years ago. They're like, Psh, whatever, dude. Mm-hmm. But that's the difference right there. Is the younger guys are like, ooh, wow, that's cool. Let's let's do that. Yep. And I remember, I fished. It was that linear tournament. I remember backing in that morning, and I remember David Nichols and all these guys, like all these super hammers on linear. They all had live scope. And I remember, you know, I'm not sure if he did, but I know a lot of them had mm-hmm. live scope. And I was out there like. I was on a 20, pretty sure I was in my 2011 Ranger with like three graphs on it that none of them, a waypoint when to go from the back to the front. <laughs> like I remember unplugging stuff all the time, uh, Ethernets, and they didn't work. And I remember going out there with a spook, just, you know, side skin. And, you know, a lot of my dad kind of gave me a recipe on how to do good. Nice. things. He's done good in the past. And, yep. and um, I remember going out there and not having live scope. But then shortly after, I did get live scope. But even then, we still didn't believe in live scope totally. Yeah. So I remember probably one of the most, the most I've ever learned in a span of time was when I went to Chickamauga for a month when I was like 18 years old. I remember going there and my pan op just That went was out. just like three years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you talked like it was like 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. It feels like it was, honestly. <laughs> but like, I remember going there and my live scope went out the first day I got there. And I was like, oh, that's good. You don't need that anyways. You need to learn, you need to learn how to set up on waypoints. You need to learn how to, you Your know. Your dad told you that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember like, always setting the boat down like now you set the boat down drop the trolling motor and hopefully hopefully you're already hitting them yeah. back then you like set the boat down 100 yards away ran your trolling motor so your cur- your cursor was f- facing the perfect direction yep. so you when you could spot like dead on the waypoint know where you're facing and everything i remember all that and like learning how to set up crankings going to scrounger you know changing directions firing left firing right you know i remember all of that so like I enjoyed it, but like I didn't get on live scope to a little bit after that. I remember when I won Harris Chain when I was 18 years old, I did catch a lot of them. Mm-hmm. I found them in live scope, but when I was catching them, it was mostly just I was just cranking. Like I knew yeah. they were there, but I wasn't like, yeah. looking for all right, them. I see a dot yeah. like yeah. way 30 yards off a grass line. I'm gonna pick off that one fish. It, I wasn't to that level yet, but it was it did come along pretty quick, and I was I did I've had it for four years. Yeah. I would say so. so I did, pretty much. Pretty the, much early. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah, when everyone mm-hmm. really started getting on it, that wasn't a hummingbird pro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if yeah. you're a hummingbird pro, then, you were without it. And every year since, it's been just yeah. more and more dudes. And then, and like I said, mm-hmm. I made a post, you know, last week. Like in 2024, you're gonna see more fish caught on a jig headed minnow with forward facing sonar than Absolutely. you've ever seen. And you know, the fans have spoken out. And of mm-hmm. course, it's not it's not fun or pleasant to watch. Absolutely not. Um, but effective. Yes. I came up with a word yesterday, by the way, I caught 26 pounds doing it yesterday. Um, femme essential. It's essential, but it's a little, you know, femme yeah. essential. Dane, what? You're going to get us canceled. No, no, we're good. We're good. Charles is smiling. It's all good, <laughs> but it's a, it's essential. It's effective. It's productive. Yep. Oh, I know what you're um, saying. Um, you know, and you know, and you're doing the jig headed minnow thing, of course. I'm oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I've been in a deep dive for the last like I don't know how long researching yeah. every oh, single yeah. one. Like yeah. it's what you gotta do to stay yeah. up with the game. Like yeah. you have it, to. We're forced to. It's like what my dad was saying. Like, you know, I went into this year with the mindset of, you know, if I can't catch them, you know, doing this, I don't deserve to be out there. But then my dad was like, Well, if you're not willing to learn and adapt to every single part of the game, then you don't deserve to be out there either. Yeah. yeah. So like I've taken both sides and, and tried to, you know, see both of them. And yeah. I've, I've kind of took the deep dive now. So. Yeah. This is his first year with live scope. His first season. He yeah. had it the last couple of tournaments last year and finally did Caught well him. last year. But good last two tournaments. It's yeah. been interesting this off season, you mm-hmm. know, him, actually seeing what he's been missing oh yeah dude time. catching huge ones i'm like facetiming her yeah, just he, like all giddy like oh my god look at the yeah. seven powder yeah just yesterday was one over seven i'm like babe they've been doing this for four exactly. years yeah. online. exactly <laughs> you're not wrong like that's exactly how it's been like 
everyone's been I've, I've been catching them in a lot of different ways than most people have picked up on until recently for like probably two years now. Yep. And there's, it's, there's it's, only there's only mm-hmm. a couple of you guys who have you know been doing that. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. very interesting. But like the fact that you you've competed without it is is, is a testament. Well, like see, once that, you get it, it's yeah, gonna be a very that's the thing is thing, thing to see. You know what's really crazy is learn learning it. You know and do, you know just yesterday you know caught a bunch of big ones doing it. Then I pick up some other lures, you know, swim bait, uh, jig or whatever it is. And like as soon as you like look up and then like cast out, cast out and look out, you immediately feel like this, Dude, this ain't right. it. Yeah, this ain't it. I can't see anything. I don't know what my bait's doing. I don't know what the fish are doing. I'm literally fishing blind. Like it's the craziest feeling. Yeah, I remember like I did really good one in one tournament. It was on James River. Yeah. And I was fishing behind two elite guys. Okay. And they were just going on the docks throwing yeah. chatterbaits and jigs. And I remember yep. I was going down with a drop shot and a mm-hmm. wacky rig, mm-hmm. like, all right, there's a fish on that pole. I'm not leaving that. He missed, it. right. And I would yeah. I I picked off like five or six bass like behind him. I was like, What in the world? And it yep. and then like these guys, you know, there but there's two there is like a double edged sword. Mm-hmm. I could be spending one too much time on a two pounder where he's targeting bigger fish and he's already put his bait in front of sure. five more five pounders. covered three hundred yards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and I remember like for a brief minute I was like, man, I'm, I might be able to do this, and all of a sudden I come back to weigh in. Those two guys in front of me have like eighteen pounds. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, See, there's something know? to be said about that. Yeah, Rick Clun recently said he's going to mix in the old school with the new school, and that's I mean the that's people who figure that out first who can truly mix in the old school. Yeah. and the new school. And the perfect blend is gonna dominate. The secret I'm sauce sure. there is 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 no is knowing when to hold when, them and then fold them. You mm-hmm. know, knowing when to make that adjustment. Yep. And that just comes from experience, which you have decades and decades <laughs> of. So, what worries you? Like, one question I wanted to ask you is: um, going into year three, they had changed the rules, right? You mm-hmm. guys actually had an off limits. Do you think that helped? I haven't really asked any of the open yeah. guys if you think it helped the fishing and how things played. I mean, honestly, last year was the toughest I've ever seen fish to catch. Ever. Really? Ever. Well, the schedule wasn't too good. Even with the good. off limits. Yeah, yeah. Even, even with the off limit. But the thing is, what, four and a half or five days? That's still, still so lot. long. And yeah. the thing is, like, when you got a month, you're only going to have a few anglers going to spend that month. So it really, yeah. most people weren't showing up until... Honestly, I think we put more pressure on the lakes because most people were showing up with three days. I remember being at the boat ramps, and it'd be like, you want to be till three days before the tournament that they would actually pack Build up the up. boat ramp. So you and think last now year, that there's officially a concrete date, people are people showing People were showing up. up even two days earlier. So it's uh, almost a funny thing is, there was almost more boat pressure right, this year because right. now people are like, well, now it's like they're, they're using changed. the allotted time. Yeah, yeah. they're using yeah. the allotted time yeah. they had, and they weren't doing that really the years before. They'd show up with two days. Interesting. But now like, now there's a rule. They're like, you know, what? I probably should do two. Interesting, yeah. And I remember, like, that was the thing with staying months before. I'd see this. Like, I remember it was it was so interesting to see. Was like, I remember going to these lakes and seeing who would be there a month yeah. ahead, and like, and watching them just choo, 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 elites. Yeah. Choo, choo, choo. And these guys, every time they would be just stepping <clears throat> up, stepping up, stepping up. And it was so neat to watch, like these guys that are grinding. Okay, so you're young, right? I'm mm-hmm. a little older, but mm-hmm. do you think that I'm not throwing a dart at you. Yeah. But that that the elites were getting the best talent with that way, with people who were when you saw the people staying there for you know a month ahead of time and stuff versus people who could only show up and fish a couple of days. Do you think that that's like a a good situation, or do you think like how do you feel about that? Again, you're young. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's a really hard question to ask because we have a very interesting thing in our sport that is, we're the only sport that you don't practice, three hundred sixty five days of the year on. Yeah, every other sport in the world, you practice every single. You have like a set Mm -hmm. like goal and a set parameters. You wake up in the morning. You practice for two hours before you go to bed. You practice for two hours. It's every like basketball. Like yeah. you have very little off seasons and like fishing's one of the only ones where like, no, you can't practice. Now you can practice in your home waters, but yeah. and fishing's also one of the only ones where your home waters, when y'all bay, if even if I fished every single day from four years old to 22, every day, the hardest working person ever on the when y'all bay, best there's ever been. 
you put me on St. Lawrence River, I'm the worst fisherman there probably is in the world. Really? <laughs> because I cannot throw a frog yeah. underneath cypress trees and right. catch fish there. Right. It's just not going to happen. So I think, like you, what, what you were saying, get back to what you're saying, don't go on a tangent, but yeah. like, I don't think the way we changed the format from three tournaments to nine tournaments was a lot bigger factor in bringing in the best anglers than it is from changing the practice times. Sure. Yeah. So, but I also do think these anglers, five time, five days is plenty of practice. I yeah. truly believe that. And I think that changes the ability. It made me a better angler. I can know that. So, yeah. So you went from being, a, you were one of the guys who were coming uh-huh. in a month early to only having five days. Obviously you could do it both ways. Mm-hmm. So now looking back, do you think you needed to be at, you know, the two years before fishing a month before? Do you think it helped you? Not in that tournament. So here's the interesting thing, thing about that. It, it hurt me. So like, I'm trying to think of one tournament in specific. So like Harris Chain, the one mm-hmm. that I bombed. I was there for a while before that tournament. And I remember driving. I went all the way to Griffin. And I remember driving from the boat ramp and driving past 150 waypoints that turned my attention. <laughs> and then getting to, this, getting to my first spot and I didn't have the confidence because I had so many things going on in my head that what if was, that spot's going off? What exactly. if this spot's going off? Yeah. So whenever my mentality changed from, or whenever I was able to take 30 days of practice in the five days of practice, mm-hmm. the amount of information was the perfect amount of information to process. Before, I was bombing t- tournaments. Like the ones I was most prepared for, Cherokee Lake spent a ton of time, Toho, ton of time. All these lakes that I was supposed to do good, technically. Right. Yeah. That I spent a lot you of time. time. Everybody in. says, oh, he spent a month there. He has to catch them. Right. Like, yeah. Those are my worst tournaments because yeah. you have such an overload of information that I couldn't process it. But yep. whenever we went to five days, I remember fishing one tournament. It was a tournament I never got a practice for. And then I just started cutting check after check after check. I cut six checks in a row at tournaments that I never pre practiced for a month before. And I was like, huh. And it wasn't the reason I practiced for a month wasn't for that year. It's for five years down the road when maybe I can't practice there and it's a scanning deal where you're looking for isolated structure. Right. You can't do that in two days. I think you know just as well as anybody oh, yeah. when you have two and a half days and you find something that's so isolated that you need like a long time to find, you don't have time in two and a half days. You're going to waste so much time to where I've already spent the time, found everything, and once I find that pattern, I don't have to go look for it. So it's already there. I that's definitely caught. beneficial, but yeah, I agree. It's just like your home home waters where you fished a million times before. Mm-hmm. When you go to these unfamiliar lakes, and you, the more time, whether it's 15 days of practice yep. or two and a half days of practice, the more time you're out there, the more that intuition, that little voice in your head gets silenced. Like exactly. right, I mean, you want to be as sharp as you can possibly be that day on the water, on that Thursday when the tournament starts and that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mm-hmm. And we're not talking about the week before we were there. We're talking about now. I just need all the information to make those decisions now. I got to mm-hmm. be as best as I can be today because that's when exactly. it counts. So if you're one of the – I'm the same as you. Like Chris can say, when I did do well, it seemed to be the ones I had less time to practice. Yeah. Like if I didn't feel well, like if I was sick, you know, and just had, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden I did well, you know, yeah. it's weird. Um, are you someone who, a lot of people have the same, you always hear in the opens, you need information. Like you got to do it, right? You got to get information. Mm-hmm. If you don't, you're not going to compete. Are you someone who can handle getting information or can't handle it because it does the same thing to you? Like it's too much. You can't process it. So Here's the thing about any sport that I've noticed is you have to learn every aspect of it mm-hmm. to be the best at it. Yeah. Because if you don't, someone else is out there doing it. Right. Yeah. So I have taken every aspect, whether it be information, research, time on the water. Yeah. Um, whatever legally whatever, you can do. Exactly. 100%. I take advantage of it the best I can because yeah. if I'm not doing it, someone else is. Yep. And it has burned me. Don't get me wrong. It's burned me a plenty of times. Mm-hmm. And it burns me more than it helps me. But the thing is, I'm not preparing previously. Now, this has changed now. It's sure. completely different. But we're going to talk about the Opens. Yeah. Because I think that's what you're getting at. Yeah, is yeah. That, I just want the viewers yeah. to understand how the Opens were, mm-hmm. you know. So, like, in the Opens, I wasn't preparing for that tournament, usually. Mm-hmm. I was preparing for when I turn 25 and I'm on the Elite Series and I'm yeah. showing up to a lake that I can't get information on. I right. only have two and a half days of practice on and I right. wasn't able to pre-practice. Sure. 
So I was in from I was hoarding information. Yeah, yeah. Whether it be scanning, time on the water, research. Yeah. That's the most important. I still think doing research, going through BFL articles, yeah. going through YouTube. every single Bassmaster Live, YouTube, going through yeah. local tur- tournament videos, going on getting on forums, finding out where tournaments are going out of Tuesday nighters, you know, yeah. release fish. Sure. Getting all that information and hoarding as much of that as you can, as fast as you can, right. you'll be able to process it. So like there's one lake that I I did really well at last year that, you know, I feel like I will be able to do good there for the mm-hmm. rest of my life because I spent, I actually had my, I had some stuff break, so I was stuck there for a long time. <laughs> yeah. I was stuck there for a while. <laughs> and I gathered so much information about over a month or two uh-huh. that I'll be able to do good there. I feel like almost every time I go because I understood the flow of the lake sure. and I understood how everything worked there. So it might have not helped me in that tournament, but whenever I go there in the future and I'm so restricted, yeah, I'm already done. Like the so, work is done. So then I have a question because, mm-hmm. so put your hat on that you're him, right? Like you're already on the elites, right? Yes. So there's some rookies who are going to qualify. So you guys, I have a bone to pick here, not with you, but with mm-hmm. Bassmaster. Who's that? Eric? Who, who does the schedules nowadays, Eric? Yeah. Lopez. Yeah. Lopez. I have a bone to pick. Um, so, you guys had four opens last year that are going to be elites. Mm-hmm. So you probably feel it when you're talking about you do everything you possibly can. You probably feel pretty good about those four lakes, right? Um, yes. And um, I definitely do feel confident on those lakes and we yeah. definitely have had an advantage over y'all. Yeah, that's what. So that's my thing. Like, do you think that Bassmaster... Um, should book opens tournaments on the same places that they're going to be going to the elites. It seems like, cause these guys, that's there's so many playing fields though. That's so hard. The hard, Also another thing, like a lot of our, me and my, me and a lot of the rookies have been talking about. That's uh-huh. very frustrating for us is we're going to lakes that y'all guys, all the guys have been on the tours for years have been right. going to for year. After so you year think after it year. evens out like all us rookies, we go to St. John's. We're like, Oh, yeah. I don't even know what this place is, how to go about it. Right. Completely lost uh-huh. to where all these elite anglers have been going there, what, 2014, 2016, 2018, 2019, sure. when, so um, many times. When and, you guys, when the schedule came out, did you do any practicing or trying mm-hmm. to, like, get info at that point before you qualified? Um, I, I mainly just practiced. Yeah. I went to, I was already at, gosh, where was I at? I can't remember where I was at, but I stopped in to do some footage and, you know, a podcast. Right. And I stopped in and I went to Smith, Blake, and Wheeler right. yeah, for yeah. a few days each, just scanning around, yeah. looking around, and trying to get an Since you were understanding. Out there exactly. It. Yeah. I definitely, but after that, I was, I was, yeah. I never was able to get on the water because I, when I came home, it was all, like I said, sponsor social media. So I didn't even get on the water until my first day of pre practice was. Feb- no, January 21st, 22nd. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And that was whenever Fort. the ice storms were there yeah. and everything. So I didn't even get to practice really at Toledo, and I only got a few days at Fort. So, like, and yeah. that's kind of – I wasn't able to do as much as I was planning on doing. So are you excited then? Because you are you uh, you were talking about how the five days helped you more than the month, mm-hmm. and now you got three days. Do you think that's really going to fit your style? It depends on the lake. So – like one lake I'm really nervous about right now is Toledo Bend. We have the a big lot of boy. yeah, we have a lot of changing conditions. Like I think if you've been keeping track of like I have, we yeah. had a we had a huge water level change. Yep. And the water temp there is already between 59 and 62. Oh wow! So with the water levels being where they're at, you know, I think it's 170.7. It's so it's right around there. It's not like 95 percent full pool. Mm-hmm. And those fish, and we're supposed to have muddy water. That's a big deal, too. Yeah. It, muddy water heats up faster than clean water. Right. So with the changing conditions, I practiced for a completely different Toledo bend than what it's probably going to be. I practiced for 95% pre-spawn, maybe a few pulling up the spawn. Yeah. And now it turns like it looks like it's going to be a 45% going to spawn and, 40, uh-huh. and 55 or 65 and 35 Spawning and not spawning. These so. rains that have been hitting Texas have been warm rains, not like this yeah, cold, they're, they're these cold rains. north storms that would like everyone was predicting. They're they're, they're warmer rains, no doubt. Yeah, and the so. water level came up so fast, so quickly. I mean, mm-hmm. and I mean, they just had a major tournament there what last last week or so. So yep. a lot of guys, you know, saw what they they were doing as well. But that's all gonna change, dude. Oh, that's yeah. none of that's gonna be happening yeah. at all. And yeah. 
that's the thing. Like, that's what I was really nervous about. That's like what they did was yeah. almost identical to what I practiced uh, with some other things thrown in. Yeah. But like, and I remember watching and I was like, and then all of a sudden you see Ot Defoe creep up there catching a few on the buzz. It's like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like, if they get on a shallow deal, yeah. I'm game for that. But Wind the thing is, bay. yeah. But the problem, like what I was getting at is with the two and a half days, what your original question was, how am I going to practice for my old practice and see if it's still there, right. but also filter in a new game plan? Am yeah. I going to have two and am I going to have enough time in two and a half days to see both, to to touch see both. both sides? Exactly. Yeah. Effectively. So do, on so, top of the rookie jitters. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> it's going to be a lot. It's going to be a handful. So you are. Th- so you do go into this thinking about history. Like mm-hmm. what you've learned first. Yes. Yeah. Because like, let's say I do abandon all of it. I'm like, you know what? Completely new week. What if there was one ditch that I found that's loaded? Right. Yeah. And right. I just wrote it off. And yeah. then all of a sudden the tournament's top 10 off. And I'm like, right. man, that was stupid. Right. So like you do have to go and give certain things a shot, but you have to do an educated. You can't go yeah. out in the middle of the lake over a main river channel and be like, right. yeah, they're going to be here. Cause right. I caught it. You got to be like, all right, well, this place leads into a spawning pocket. You got to make educated choices. And you got, especially when you got a time frame like you're talking about. Right. So I just got to, I got to make good decisions. That's what it's going to do. Simply so what it's going to come down to. It's interesting hearing decisions. you because we've been married for what, eight years now, seven, eight years. We've been together a long time. Mm-hmm. Like probably, you know, since you were born up, you know, you're <laughs> so young. Um, but he's like the opposite. Anytime he has pre before forward facing sonar, that yeah. might change the whole game. Right. But. Mm-hmm. Before, if he ever pre practice, he was guaranteed to bomb that tournament. If he ever very put common. any yeah. extra effort, like he would, as the years go by, he knew like he just had to show up to practice That's, for the. Like elite. I said, you get blinded by you get blinded by what you previously saw and experienced. You know, it's That's the sure. fresher it is, the better for me. That's I mean, that's just me, right? You try to figure it out those eight hours that freaking day, you mm-hmm. know, but. It is advantageous to have information to go back on, like in the back of your mind, to lead up to those key decisions, you know, that lead to a top ten, you know, and and but it's a fine line between that top ten with, and that bottom um, ten. With forward facing sonar, this is a question for both of you guys. Yep. Do y'all think that um, now it is advantageous to go early and scan and like say there's a bunch of brush piles or something in a lake, like to do stuff like that? With the power of forward-facing sonar? I think it's a lot less. Like, way yeah. less. I think it's so, like, I feel like 90% of the places we go, you can probably drop the trolling motor down and find enough yeah. quality yeah. to do good. Like, yeah. it's it's a lot more simple in a way. If you're uh-huh. very good, like, if you watch Drew Gill and, yeah. like, a lot of these new anglers that I just are learned so who good. he was the last two weeks. Yeah, I got to spend a lot of time with him at the Yamamoto GSM shoot. He's a uh-huh. nitro guy, isn't and he? Yep. Yeah. Best Triton. Pro. Triton. Best Sorry, Triton, Triton guy. Yeah. Yes. And he shocked me beyond belief. I remember getting out there, you know, just one angler a year. I think I'm good and all that stuff, whatever. And then I get out there with like Tucker Smith and Drew Gill and some of these guys. I'm like, yeah. my jaws on the floor, like next to these guys, because they're so much more impressive than I ever dreamed of being with a forward facing sonar. Wow. And like, I'd be, I remember I got, I got in Tucker Smith's boat and, um, I cast like 30 dots and I get a bite. He's like, all right, 30 minutes went by. You can have the trolling motor. He gets up there, catches like three in a row. I was like, oh my yeah. gosh, same bait. <laughs> and I'm just, then I get, and I, could, I start talking with Drew Gill, and he's talking about how he has like 13 different baits and 13 different size weights. And, you know, he he does every single little thing different. He has it weighted more toward the front than the back. And I'm like, yep. just little bitty, yep. tiny yeah. differences. Yep. And then, and, but, like we were talking about earlier, it's the little things that always count. Yeah. yeah. Every time. Yep. And I learned more in that GSM week with them boys that are so much more educated in that sense. And I was like, wow, I need to step it up. Yep. And that, like these last two weeks, I have been hard as I can go. It, it lit a fire in me. Yep. And same but, here. Yeah. But it's been very cool to watch like guys. So what's crazy elite. though is you still were number one in the EQs. You mm-hmm. like. You smash the competition. So even though you aren't this like crazy forward facing sonar guy, the fact that obviously you've got that blend you were talking about and that, like Mm -hmm. you were saying, the guy who can find that blend is the one that's going to dominate. So you did it in the EQs. Well, my thing is I'm really good at live scoping structure. Mm -hmm. These guys are good at live scoping water. Open water. (laughs) Like, I mean, 
I remember I got in the boat and we just drove out in the middle and just set the boat. I was like, what are they doing? He's like, what is this? I was like, there's no way there's fish out here, right? Yep. And then all of a sudden he, he sets the boat down. He drops to a bait ball and there's 11. I'm like, how do you know? He's like, oh, yeah, the way the ditch channel runs. And also when you got the wind blowing and the current runs this way, they just come up here. And I was like, yeah. I was going to go fish that point because there's probably a brush pile on it. It's yeah. high percentage. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I was like, the one that everybody's going to fish. And you sound get like him when he's yeah. come home. Yeah. Yeah. And like, it was such an interesting thing to go there and like watch these guys completely. Like I thought I was like pioneering a new way to fish and then <laughs> I get in the boat with these guys. I'm like, we're, we're on the middle of a lake with not a single contour. We're chasing around bait. I'm like, it's crazy the, dude. And then I got out there. Like, you know, I spent some time once fork went off limits. I went out to Bob Sandlin, Holbrook and a couple other lakes and I started chasing around bait and like, it's like, just like how they pulled up there uh-huh. and like dropped the troll motor down. It's not random. Right. Not at all. Oh, I pattern. learned there's a pattern to it. I learned yeah. very shortly you don't just drive out to the middle mm-hmm. and drop the trolling motor. And I remember spent a little bit of time and then I, I went out on the lake a couple of days after kind of learning a lot about it. And I I was like, you know what, I'm a, I'm gonna get it this time. And I drove out to the middle and I sat down and it was bait everywhere. And I was <laughs> like, I finally. Yeah. And it's like it's pretty neat how like it seems like a lot of people were like, oh, just go drop forward facing sonar. I was like, yeah, go do that. Yeah. Let me know how it works out for you. Yeah. It's like, let me know how that works out for you. And then, like, it's so you got to give them their credit because sure. they've mastered something that not many people have. And, like, another thing, like, I like to look at it as they pioneered something. Yeah. They invented a way to catch fish. Yeah. yeah. They're just, they're not just better. Yeah. They are completely in a different masters. category. Yeah. yeah, it's like Josh Jones. He, Josh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He, Josh uh, Jones. He um he doesn't give many fishermen credit, you know. Mm-hmm. But I know when he does give a fisherman credit, that dude's like generational. And he went fishing with Josh Jones one day and comes back to the camper and was like, "Yeah, that dude's really good. Like, really good." Yeah, and the interesting thing is, is he got to start crappie fishing. I, yeah, I, I'm. Correct me if I'm wrong with any of this, but I remember watching him and he crappie fished. Yep. Mm-hmm. And crappie fishermen were doing this out in the middle bait ball chasing stuff with crappie yeah. way before we ever dreamed of yeah. it. Yeah. And we were watching Josh Jones and he was dominating crappie tournaments, yeah. winning hundreds of thousands of yeah, dollars. Yeah, they accused him yeah. of cheating so many times because yeah. he was just smoking everybody. And like he was pioneering something. Yeah. yeah. And I remember he was the first one to use these 14 foot rods with Dobbins. Yeah. yeah. And I remember he was watching these videos and like he would get in boats with people and like they would bite and he would catch everyone and they would bite and he, they couldn't catch anything. And they're yeah. just looking at him like he's crazy. I'm like, he invented that. Dude. Yeah. You cannot get out there new yeah. and think you're going to compete against a guy I've, like that. I love it's so Josh. impressive. I love Josh. He is so weird. I'm talking about, <laughs> I, I would say it to his face, dude. Dude's out there. It's yeah. what it takes, though, but sometimes. Yes, yeah. that's what it takes, because he is constantly, no matter what it is, thinking outside the box. There's always, like, that's one of my big mottos. It's never good enough. Yeah. Ever. Yeah, somebody's mm-hmm. figuring something Someone's out. Someone's working yeah. when you're sleeping. Yeah. Someone's figuring out something while you're complacent. Yeah. There's always something changing. He'll that's come. True. He'll come home, and, you know, people will be sandbagging and stuff, and I'll say, Chris, there are people... That are smashing them. Yeah. No matter what those guys are telling you, there are people smashing them this tournament. Always. They will smash them. Ignore they the sandbaggers. Do. Yeah. That's what I was talking to my cousin, you know, Jacob Tompkins. And he's McLovin? Is that McLovin? <laughs> <laughs> and we he was out there at Okeechobee and you know, he was saying it's tough. I'm like, dude, these open guys are different. They yeah. smoke them. Yeah. Like and he competed against him last year. He knows very well and I don't have to tell him. He's very he knows his stuff. Yeah. And I remember I was like, dude, it's gonna take fifteen pounds a day on the yeah. dot. Yeah. And like they don't, they don't every falter. time they don't fall, they yeah. don't screw up, they don't yeah. mess up out there. And it was, I mean, you look at the weights and all of a sudden you're like, I'm glad I wasn't that tournament. Yeah. <laughs> I'm then, glad I'm gone. And what you're saying, that's what happens on the elites. You can double exactly. whatever that line is, double it. And then they'll, if you think weights are going to drop, just add a pound to it. Yeah. Add two pounds. Yep. Add yep. two pounds. So true. And, and it's like most of the field, I mean, you would think, you know, they'd stumble a little bit, but dude, the networking that goes on, all, all legal, of course, they talk to each other, Yeah. pick up a little nugget over here, a little nugget of info over here, put it, it all together. Oh, I kind of saw yeah. these two guys run up this river over here. Oh, wow. Those two guys are up in the standings. Uh, maybe I should go cruise up the river. That happens daily. Uh, of daily. Course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're the best at making decisions based off of their recent experience, just like you're talking about. And it about. doesn't take a lot for any league guy. To no. Yeah. No. Like, you can literally tell them, I'm throwing a jerk bait, and it'll 
boop, boop, yeah. boop. Yeah. They walk past your boat at takeoff and see one bait tied on, oh, yeah. and that will trigger something. Oh, it's nasty. It's, it's a nasty like business. Yeah. Crazy. Um, do you have you made friends with a lot of the elite guys yet? I wouldn't say a lot of them. I got to know some at the classic this year, but one that I've known for a long time is Gussie, and he's like that's a good one. He's yeah. my favorite human being when it comes to fishing. Like, yes. I love that man. And he's right. like, you know, he's, he stayed at my house before and, you know, he invited me to stay at his house at the Bassmaster Classic and he's just like one of the most stand-up guys in the industry. A thousand percent. And I'm looking forward to just, you know, getting being able to kind of connect with him a little more now that I'm yeah. in the same tournaments with him. Yeah. But I remember like being in the, being in the house when he was there at the Winya Bay and like watching him and how he attacked everything he's like a social media he's super smart when it comes to that. i remember him writing articles every night you know he was one of those guys that you know he took care of his sponsors very good he does yeah. very good and i remember he works extremely hard and i remember seeing that i was like wow yeah it was so cool to see like a legend like that he doesn't up close. get the respect that he deserves no. i feel like in our industry Not at all. um he needs you could do a content series around Gussie and it would thrive. Blow up. Yeah, I agree. Like you, you put a GoPro. Yeah. Like, if you could just get a guy to just toss a GoPro in his yeah. boat without him knowing and record every single day of his life and take and edit every bit yeah. of it, he'd be, like, one of the biggest anglers because he's just so unintentionally entertaining yes. and just an awesome guy. <laughs> good dude. That, and, he, and he's so sneaky good, too. Like, go look at go look at his elite standings yeah. every year. He, he you never see him hardly out the top 20 of the points. Right. I think last year he stumbled, but, I mean, if you win a classic, I think you have a... You can got, stumble. Got a lot yeah. going on. You yeah. can stumble a little bit. He has he had probably so much stuff going on that... Yeah. And, like, and the thing is, it's so easy to stumble in the elites. A stumble is only, what, I think 10 spots every single tournament is 20, point, yeah. 20 spots or 30 spots. So, right. uh, the slightest little stumble... You're screwed. Yeah. yeah. So... Yeah. But, like, he's one of the most consistent anglers when it comes to every single aspect of the sport. And I've always looked up to him for that. And I've always, you know, been really appreciative to meet him at a young age. That's, uh, I don't know what to think about you, but I think I like you. Because that's a, like, saying him. Pretty that's wise a, for a young yeah, guy, that's dude. A, yeah, that's uh, proving your character's pretty strong to pick Gussie out of everyone. As as you were growing up, who, I mean, who, who did you try to follow, emulate? Uh, who did you look up to? I mean. Because I'm thinking, you know, everyone says Rick Kluns and the Larry Nicks. Well, in my generation, anyways, yeah. Kevin Van Dam, you know. But uh, who who did you like watch and follow? Yeah. Um, Besides your dad, I remember I loved watching for some reason Steve Kennedy. Like, yeah. yeah, I love yeah. Steve Kennedy, the big bass Same. specialist. Yeah. Like if there's ever big weights in a tournament, he's bringing them. He's yeah, and he's like, doing something weird too the, all the time. The big the big swim baits. I remember him throwing a glide bait at Okeechobee. I yeah. was like, what in the world? And he's yeah. sitting there catching like five pounders, and he's frogging holes, and everyone's throwing these little senkos and everything. I remember like. Every time I watch him, I, I love it. And then he, he goes to St. Lawrence and throws like a, a giant glide bait for small with him. Like, yeah, this yellow is, purse. This is, yeah. yeah. It's the um, Sneaky Pete. Yeah. And is was, that the one he was painting at his yeah. RV that day? Yeah. It was so sick. I remember just watching him for a long time. I looked up, I look up to him a lot. Like, I just love watching him. And then also, you know, I looked up to Wheeler for a long time with the social media side. Like, he's so good with social media. He was such a good angler. When it came to being so well rounded in every aspect yeah. of the sport, and I look up to him for the ability to attack social media and also still be on top of the game right. the way he is, yeah. and that's one thing I've always looked for. You know, that's one one thing I want to grow for myself is, you know, I want to start my social media, but I also don't want to lose the fishing ability when it yeah, comes to I staying can't. on top. You got to balance. You got to balance. Those. And it's one of the hardest things there is the balance, and I really respect all the guys that do balance. You know who the goat is at that? Is Scott Martin. Scott Absolute Martin. goat at yeah, that. He set the TV standard. show, YouTube. Oh my goodness! Like, tour. Scott Martin. I remember he's another one that I looked up to for a long time, and I don't know if he will remember this, but I remember he probably like I don't. He probably won't remember this aspect, but I remember <laughs> it super well. I went fishing with him on Okeechobee one time, uh-huh. and. I we like I told you we always fish out of a fourteen foot John boot. So my dad would always stand on one side and he has to stand on the other. So yeah. I, I couldn't hold my rod a certain yeah. way. Is your dad we're, short like you? Yeah, he's yeah. he's actually a little shorter than I am. And, um, <laughs> Apple so <laughs> yeah, so we I mean we were so close to each other, so I could only hold my rod a certain way. So I didn't hold it like everyone. If you're you know you hold your rod like this and it laid right here. Yeah. Well, I held it like this. Yeah. Like if I showed you, you'd be like, how is that even? possible right and i was holding i was everything over here and i set the hook wow. in the most awkward and i remember scott martin was like dude what are you doing <laughs> and like i remember i was like 
Uh, I don't know. It's just the way I've always done it. And he fixed it like in the one day of fishing. Like told it, you. He's like, like McCoy, McCoy, you seeing yeah. this? Get this. Get shoot this. Or, yeah. yeah. And I remember <laughs> going on the water with him that day. And it was probably one of the most fun days of fishing because one thing he's also a master of is making everyone feel special. Right. And I remember yeah. how special he made me feel that day. Everything's like a show. Yeah. It was like, know? it was literally like he's a an show. He's an entertainer. He's an entertainer. And I remember, I remember buying an Akuma rod and thinking I had, I was the next, like, yeah. I was the next Scott Martin. I yeah. had this Akuma rod. <laughs> oh That's my awesome, goodness. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. And like, it was such an awesome day. I mean, he said, let's make a competition. Then I remember catching a mud fit. I remember every minute of that day. I don't know if he remembers He built you a little Scott Martin challenge that day. Yeah. That's awesome. That's exactly what yeah. it was. He built like a little Scott Martin challenge. I remember. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I couldn't remember if it was him or me catching the mudfish, and he says, I'm up one. And nice. It was something like that. Or it was like, either take away one for me because I caught a mudfish, or he got one because he caught, I can't remember 100%, but I remember it was an awesome day of fishing, and I look up to him a lot. I He's think awesome. as a young angler, it's important to idolize someone, especially not someone. Not idolize. Look well, up. That's look up to. I, I don't like I mean, that word. You, I mean. It's <laughs> not biblical. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, yeah, it's important to look up to an angler, especially, obviously, a successful one, because, I mean... Yeah, I mean, look what he did at the Open. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. that was the most dominant oh, yeah. performance. I mean, in the in the last three years, can you think of a more dominant no, tournament? No, he set a record, three-day I mean, record. Milliken came close to the... Yeah. Like probably the most dominant tournament. I like I like what Milliken did. That was pretty cool with the glide bait and everything. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, we're all like, no, you can't throw big glide baits and Opens, and he goes in there and wins one. Like a second tournament, that was pretty sick. And then... But like the way um, Scott Martin dominated that tournament yeah. with forward facing sonar, it was pretty. But good. in a different way that was done with Tyler Rivette. It, it was awesome. It was pretty cool, just because Scott struggled since he's been on the elites, mm-hmm. um, and he does have so much going on. So Ooh, just so much going for on. him to, and then with his mom, he missed the classic two two years in a row, right? No, just no? one. He was yeah, last man in. Remember? Oh, that's yeah. right. That's right. He okay. Was last man in. And he. Almost became... And now he's the first man in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. It's funny how that works. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I think he set the whole industry... Well, his dad did the TV show thing, but like for new school, he set the formula of social media, YouTube, yep. and tournament fishing. So you have to give him credit there. Speaking sure. of, so as a young JT Tompkins, I mean, you know the formulas to be successful on the water, whether it's time, uh, research... Um, you know, actually applying it during tournaments, so on and so forth. So, what's the mo- what's the next move, social media wise? How do we how do we attack growing social media? Because let me tell you, it's it's t- it's hard. It's tough. It's hard getting it's very, followers. Very hard. Yeah. So, what's the move? Yeah. So, I actually, you know, I invested in cameras. I yeah. got a GoPro three sixty, a couple Osmos. Yep. And then I'm working on getting some other stuff. But I got an editor now, nice. and he's gonna be. I already sent him a bunch of footage from Fort practice, Toledo practice, and also some just some fun days. Yeah at some lakes around the fork area and i'm super i'm looking forward to seeing what he does with him i think he's going to do an awesome job but that's what i'm trying to do you know i'm trying to work as hard for my sponsors as they work for me and you know double the return for them is my goal and you could almost so these conversations you have with your sponsors you know pre-season and everything when you tell them that hey i hired an ed- i've invested mm-hmm. in an editor in these cameras all this equipment i'm going to invest more time mm-hmm. you can almost hear their ears like whoo Really? Yeah. You could almost hear them, you know, perk up, mm-hmm. you know, through the phone. Um, and I said, you know, when he walked in the door, I was like, hey, meet Charles. You know, he's the lure. We dangle in front of sponsors yeah. to get them to bite. And that's what it is. How do you get a leg up on the other hundred something guys or how many guys do we have in the elite field this year? Oh, probably like 102 or four. I forget. Depends, 102, I think. Yeah, yeah. depends on medical. Exemptions. I mean, how do you, yeah, how do you get a leg up? I mean, you got to stand out. How do you stand out? That's the key. It's hard for us. We're both five foot something. Yeah. You know, how do you. <laughs> And that's the key in everything. Like, even when it comes to bass fishing, like, what's the next thing that I can do for myself to, to stand out? Yeah. What am I going to do that's different from the other 102 yep. guys? So it, that's like... Constantly that's ask yourself motto. that. Yep. That's another motto yep. that, like, I've always tried to adopt is, what do I need to do next to stand out? What yep. do I need to do different that yep. is going to push me a little bit further? Obviously winning, but it's... it's yeah. You're not, you can't win every week, right? And you're no, not going to win every week. Win. Yeah. Yeah. So. When you have dealt with sponsors lately, mm-hmm. have you been surprised? And uh, do you, what's a rookie sponsorship like these days? Like, what's it like? Is are they still like pretty heavy product, or do you have opportunities to make something as a rookie, endemically? I think the only problem with me was this year, in like monetarily and you know and a lot of cinches with sponsors was i never really had a relationship with sponsors right going right you're new i mean you're like the only company that actually that i i have going into this year 
that it truly gave me a shot before anybody else did was Outcast Tackle. Mm-hmm. And like I'm really appreciative of those guys. Those guys are awesome. They build some of the most quality baits there are in the market. And they're coming out. They're always coming out with something new, and they're going to be coming with a lot of new stuff here soon. And that was one company that I could build a relationship, and it just grew and grew. And like I really appreciate that. But like that's the main thing that I learned this year is it's not easy to give a ton of money to somebody that you're dealing with for the first time. Yeah, yeah it's true. And I understand that. Like I'm, I'm a risk. Yeah. And that's my goal this year is to get with these sponsors and show them that I'm going to work just yeah. as hard as they work and twice as hard to do what I can to make, yeah. you know, to make them back. That's a, but they invest. That's a good way to look at it. A lot of the rookies don't look they at don't it that them. way. Think you about know, it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. they think, you know, they d- are deserving and, Blah blah blah, but oh, I made the elites. I yeah, mean, here it is. Me there it right is. Now. If you here's my routing number. Question, if you can't an- answer the question on what are you gonna do for me, because yeah. that's that's the first thing. Yeah, like it's what you can do for them, not what they can do for you. Right. That's the first thing when it comes to sponsors, because I ask ninety percent of the people if they can return it ten times. Yeah, they're like, oh, I don't. Yeah. they kind of sit back in their seat and they're like. Well, I don't really know. When they ask, okay, will you give me five grand? Mm -hmm. And then you look at them, say it's like a jig company, and you're like, okay, five grand. Yeah, can you sell, first let's start off, can you sell $5,000 worth of jigs? Yeah. And if they say, yeah, yeah, I think I could do that. And I'm like, well, you're still not there because I need to make money on it. I only make 20 cents off each jig, so really you got to sell like probably 35,000 jigs. How are you going to do that for me? Yeah. And then if you can't answer that question in an educated way and also tell them how you're going to do in surplus. Right. That's one thing I learned. I was caught off guard, just like everybody else I'm sure was, was I didn't have the answers to all the questions. I didn't. I really, I didn't. And that's why I'm working as hard as I can, you know, whether it be social media, whether it be fishing, like I'm always going to be, that's my thing. Like I might not be able to give you a dialed in number, Uh but I will tell you that I'm going to be working as hard as I possibly can for you. And I'm going to do whatever I can in that time frame that we're going to be working together for you. Yeah. My best advice for you, you obviously understand the networking you talked about, like you have to build actual relationships. With yes. People, long-term relationships. Where you can call them on the phone and they want to talk mm-hmm. to you. That's huge. Um, my best advice is um, make it where if an opportunity comes to that company and they need to pick one person that they're, you're the first thought in their mm-hmm. mind. Um, whether it be like a Bass Pro and they have a company come along that says, hey, you know, we want to partner with you. Do you have an angler that can represent us? Mm-hmm. You want to be that person that they say, I know for a fact this person will represent them well. They're going to make them happy. Mm-hmm. They're going to deliver. And uh, a lot of deals happen that way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. People don't understand, but a lot of things happen that way. So you always want to be that person that the sponsor's like, I know for a fact they can get it done. Mm -hmm. I'm going to choose them. You're in your building phase right now. It's like, yeah, I mean, you you said it, right? You don't, the only thing you lack is the history. Like you have no history. You're fresh. You're brand new. You're just learning all this stuff, but you're definitely laying down the foundation um, that is needed to succeed and to be a part of that, you know, that bigger, that bigger picture. But um, yes, those little, those little steps, you know, all the little things. Yeah. Yeah, and before you know it, you're three, four, five years down the road yeah. with with mega deals. It, we'll it took me like I seven, so. eight years. Oh, it. I'm takes not saying time. I have mega deals, but like it takes it takes it a takes while. Time. Yeah, it takes a while. But um, you, I've always heard it. You you don't really start seeing stuff happen until about three. Yeah, not even. I'd say six. Yeah, I'm just saying like, like the the yeah. the, the, the roots couple, are, yeah. are planted and starting to sprout. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But you could always fall back on that baseline of hey that guy's a hell of a bass fisherman like that guy catches them like that is the baseline yes that's the baseline people take you seriously that's a, yeah. a good foundation yeah, yeah. The, the reason why though is because your name's popping up maybe your marketing's not good but your name's popping up on bass live mm-hmm. or whatever constantly so that your name's popping up without you doing anything and then when you add in you know the marketing side it just i mean doubles it. I'll, I'll probably one of the most notable things i remember seeing was I remember seeing him sell out thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of swim baits off a yeah. tournament finish. I remember yeah. him in Fort Loudon yeah. blasting them. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I remember seeing at the classic swim baits flying Gone. off the shelves yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So like, yes, tournament finishings do sell baits. Thousand yeah. percent. And there's a lot of people who prove it. Yeah. And like, that's one thing like I can do that 
now. Right. It takes time to build social media, but yeah. I can try to get that opportunity that opportunity yeah. for y'all as fast as possible. So that's what I'm going to try to do is, you know, blend it as pos- best yeah. I possibly can. And yeah. as, you know, once social media gets to the point where I can legitimately invest enough money into it to uh-huh. see, you know, I'm not completely losing every you, bit of it. Do you have a, okay, so I really like you so far, but do you have, like, he's got like, almost like a a wrestler personality you know he's like kind of got his quirky things he does do you have that when you like, fish or anything do you have like a routines i mean wrestler personality well like you have this like when you catch a fish you oh, just like that's... go absolutely nuts yeah. are you that guy if you watch, like, I think the most emotion I've ever caught over a fish catch was at Watts Bar when I caught a five pounder. Yeah. But I'm I like, saw those photos, I, I think. Yeah. It was a vi- there was a video on video. Bassmaster, okay. and like, I got pretty excited about that yeah. one because I thought I was going to win yeah. at that time because I was, you know, I was getting bites. But like, I've had co anglers tell me, like, dude, you just put 20 pounds in the box and you didn't crack a smile. I was like, you're just chill. Yeah. Just like, do cameras make you nervous? No, in the boat. I, I like good. cameras pretty good. good. Like, good. I've had a some pretty good days with cameras good. in my boat. Good. Like, I remember my first tournament win with was the first day I ever had a camera in my boat on uh, Chesapeake Bay, and I I had like, I think I came back eleven pounds in that tournament, and like I remember having a camera and I was like, dude, this is pretty cool. I could get used to this. Yeah. And like, that's a good. Start. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Like I'm yeah. I'm looking forward to the growth of, you know, being on camera, getting better, being able to talk in front of people, getting yeah. better. Yeah. About talking in front of a camera. That's my biggest thing. I cannot stand yeah. seeing myself on camera, number one, and hearing myself. For yeah. some reason, that voice you're hearing, I swear it's not the voice I'm hearing. I'm, <laughs> I'm the same way. It drives I, yeah. me nuts. Yeah. I hate like, hearing myself. Yeah, I can't So stand just it. remember, like, okay, so Bass Live, whatever, you know, you earn that, that camera in your boat for whatever X reason, catching them or, um, you know, just being on a roll, whatever it is. Um, just remember, you know, you're there to catch fish and put them on the scales yeah. at three o'clock or whatever. But mm-hmm. um, there are people watching. Yes. And want to enjoy be, watching. Yes. Be, my advice. Yeah. Be absolutely genuine. Right. If you're a chill, well-spoken dude, that's awesome. Um, but um, either be entertaining or be educational yes. or sell stuff, but mm-hmm. not the used car salesman guy. Right. Yeah, not that quite. guy. Mm-hmm. If you take care of educational and entertaining, the sales this will come this, along with absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The more genuine you are, the better. The, like, it, yeah. People attach to you a lot easier. Yeah. You don't have to force it. And yeah. that's why also, too, you know, when you go to select sponsors, you have you to pair pair with someone. With quality. Pe- yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That you actually believe in it, actually use their stuff. Mm-hmm. And yes, every now and then, like, hey, you know, I, you know, I've been with Strike King. I've been with Megabass. There have been times when I've been with Megabass and I throw other jerk baits and they got mm-hmm. like an awesome jerk bait. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there are those those instances. Absolutely. But overall, you know, you know this. Overall, pair with the the people you believe in, and just it all takes care of itself. Mm-hmm. It's a lot easier to be a genuine person yeah. when you have when you have good sponsors behind. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, it's been interesting. Yeah, what mm-hmm. else you got? I've got a two prong question here, um, and one prongs for you, the seconds for. Do you hunt? Uh, I don't have time oh, to God. hunt. I oh. wish I, I wish I could hunt. He's she, about to ask if you want to go hog hunting. That's tonight. my second prong. To yeah. <laughs> my Dude, I am God. I am game for anything. I love. I knew that was coming. Uh, it doesn't matter I what it about, is. I thought about this before you even got here. I was like, I put money. He's gonna go. You oh, want to go hog man. hunting tonight? Yeah. He, yeah. He oh, hits things. Okay. We have a truck. Our even our, better. Yeah. Our one tons in the shop. Been in the shop for a month. From the deer he hit, the mm-hmm. Toyota he smoked another hog. I mean, it's every time. Yeah. Hey, Texas Some has got him. Yeah. yeah. So you have you hog hunted before? I've never hog hunted before, but it, like yeah. I've deer hunted, but I I mean I never I genuinely have never time. have time. You're fishing. Yeah. Like yeah. I if I'm not fishing, I'm thinking about fishing. If I'm yeah. thinking about if I'm not thinking about it, I'm watching it. Like, yeah. It's it's like a 24 hour job, and like yeah. I always feel like if I'm not fishing, I'm not. There's someone else who is, and it drives me nuts. So he didn't hunt. He was like you. Uh-huh. And then I do want to hunt, though. the last, like, two, three years, he's, like, picked up the hunting thing. Not I've always been a gun guy, but I, I lived in California, so there's not very many <laughs> opportunities to do but that. But he's not, like, sitting a stand type hunting. He likes to be on his feet. And on so the ground. hogs like, allow him to do that. I'll tell you the thing that I enjoy more is, like, when, when we went deer, me and my dad went deer hunting, 
like shooting it, whatever. That and yeah. I was like, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. It was more like okay. He rubbed on that tree. He yeah. rubbed on that tree 100 yards. The he process. rubbed on that tree. Yeah. There's two trails. So tri- them. Like yeah. you triangulated. This is where he lives. There's a there's the briar patch yeah. where he sleeps every night, and he's going to come here every single yeah. day. Same and then thing intersecting it. Yeah. yeah. Like I love the planning and the dissection of his life cycle. Yeah. That's what I like. I really enjoy. But like hunting is probably dangerous for me because if I did do it, I'd probably never stop. Yeah. yeah. So that would be a really like, Another thing, I like golf too. Like golf's one yes. thing that I, I play. I play golf when I'm home. I'm I'm terrible. I don't have yeah. enough time. I don't like. Trust me. I wish there was enough room in my truck to bring my golf. You need to because when they oh, like no. call a tournament day, like when they can't, everyone go out. goes golfing. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, I'm five foot two. Like I'm not. Was, I'm not using anybody else's golf clubs. I was gonna say like when, that's when, that's the other problem we got. Yeah, when JT buys a new set of golf clubs, like how much. How many inches do you have the 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 golf smith guy take off <laughs> your, your, your clubs? <laughs> I think the last one he was like, Ugh. <laughs> I don't know if we can make these fit. That's <laughs> awesome. We'll go to the extra stiff women's and yeah. cut them half an inch <laughs> yeah. off. That's funny. So beautiful. What else you got? I think I'm good. I think I think the fishing world likes J T. Tompkins, dude. Yeah. I know we do, and that's yeah. why you're sitting here. Like I said, that that message you know you sent me back mm-hmm. in September. I I didn't know you, you know. I mean, I met you at the classic maybe one time, and um, but that's like huge respect. I mean, that's like you want to be prepared for everything and anything thrown at you, um, and being proactive, not reactive in this business is like everything, right? Yeah, and I remember like when I was trying to, I was trying to figure out. I mean, I was going through my phone. Who do I want to reach out to? And like I was going through all these people, and I'm like, man, like there's one podcast that it was the alls podcast, and I remember watching it all the time. I'm like, dude. It went from like this little thing, and yeah. now it's like something I have to watch yeah. every single time. And the way she's taken over and like helped you so much, she and takes then, over all yeah, right. Yeah, like, <laughs> like she, she does a lot more than what a lot of people realize. I'm yeah. sure because oh, I probably yeah. don't even realize nearly what she does for everything. It. And yeah. like, that's why I want to talk to y'all because I feel like y'all guys really understood a lot of different things. You understand the sponsor sides, you understand the fishing, and also the relationships. And a lot of different areas, and I, I knew if that if I could if I could get a piece of that, I'd just be a little bit better off. Years so. and years of mistakes, man, and that's what mm-hmm. you know now. And now look, you're, I mean, you're sitting here, um, yeah, it's um, it's a it's a heck of a way to make a living. And I don't have to tell you that, but it's definitely fruitful if if you work hard enough. Definitely, I'd mm-hmm. say I've been around a lot of rookies, or you know, I've been with him for a long time, and you have a mindset that most don't yeah it's dangerous dude that is dangerous you have a work ethic which is number one but you're respectful you understand like it's more than just you Mm -hmm. to get somewhere and that's huge yeah Um, i think you you got a solid chance to make it and i think a lot of people watching we have a lot of people in the industry that are watching and they're probably thinking i should uh talk to that rookie you know yeah you're very well spoken you obviously can catch fish, and uh, you're young. Yeah, mm-hmm. and if you guys aren't uh, the, for the viewers who you know who are looking to invest, you know your time and following into someone, absolutely the guy. Yeah, definitely. So you go by Jordan Tompkins on JT. JT. Yeah, yeah. I like. I've always been called JT. I played sports, played soccer, all three sports in high school, yeah. MMA, and everything. And yeah. um, every every single time, there's always a ton of Jordans. Every single time, yeah. like every soccer team I've been a part of, there's like five Jordans. Like, all right, you're either Jordan number two, three, or four, that or you're sucks. JT. And yeah. I was like, we'll just go with JT because yeah. I don't feel like being Jordan number two. That's smart. So, yeah. Well, and it stuck. That's what I've always been called, and I, I, I like it, and it sticks out a little more. So, Well, you said a lot. You said it all. Man, I, like I said, you're definitely wise beyond your years, and we'll be definitely paying attention. So, And if you ever need help along the way on tour, dude, I'm always a phone call away. Mm-hmm. I'm always fishing the same body of water yeah. as you. Um, before we let you go, uh, we, we got to ask, I mean, at 22 years old, mm-hmm. um, give the viewers some life advice, man. What have you learned in 22 years of living your, your dad, your father and, and mother have set you up awesome foundation to succeed in the sport. Uh, you know, what have you learned and what can you, what life advice can you give the viewers as we part ways? I think the two most important things that I've learned in the last few years is, Number one, hard work. That's been like my number one motto, like that my parents have given me. I mean, my dad didn't really come from much. Yeah. And he got everything in his life along with my mom. Earned was, it. Earned it. Mm-hmm. And they did it through hard work and they, they passed it on to me. 
And I think hard work will get you further than most other things. Yeah. And also is just be a good good person, a positive person, and just try your best. Like positivity is such a thing that people gravitate towards. And I, I'm the worst possible person for that. Like you get around me in a tournament, I'm the I'm the Debbie Downer around tournaments like I'm not catching whatever it may be. And like that's one thing I've learned. Like also on live, like you gotta in a lot of different avenues, being positive being nice, you know, treating everyone exactly how you want to be treated. Like, that's the really the number one thing. Treat everyone how you want to be treated right. and work as hard as you possibly can. Yeah. And if you do those things, do those things, you will go as far as you ever dreamed you could go if yeah. you do those two things right there. And I think that's the two number one things people need to focus on is treat people how you want to be treated and work as hard as you possibly can. I do have another question. I had it earlier. It's what's your goals for this year? Like, what is your goal? So, of course, I want to be the best singer I can be. You know, Rookie of the Year, that is one thing that I've been on my mind all year is winning Rookie of the Year, but also is growing relationships out there, meeting yeah. new people, and then also meeting everyone in the industry. Like, I love this, the social side of it, and then also working hard as my sponsors. I want to grow my social, me- social media. Yeah, on the water, deal. though. Like, on the elites. Okay. Like, do you have, like, okay, this is where I need to be? Do you have, like, a a tournament goal mm-hmm. like single tournament and do you have like a season goal on the elites um of course everyone wants to win one and yeah. i feel like i'm going to have an opportunity at a win it's mm-hmm. just capitalizing on it mm-hmm. and then i'll have an opportunity at rookie of the year yeah if but i need to capitalize on it so those are my two goals i've i want to win one really bad and i want to win rookie of the year but of course like the number one thing i want to do is make it to the bassmaster classic cuz I got a taste of it, and I don't think I can ever go in right. a year without it. Like, it, it's going to sting this year sitting back and watching that, you know, Please transpire. But sit back with him. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. it's, unfor- right. it's unfortunate, but it's it's by far the, the king. The, yeah. It's the top of bass fishing, and that's why I'm in the elites is for that event. So hopefully that's going to be my next year where I'll be again. Well, awesome. Manny, congratulations for making it this far, man. You're absolutely going to fit in and absolutely love it on tour. Um, thank you for your time tonight. Absolutely. And congratulations. Cause you talked about positivity. This has been the most positive bilge podcast we've absolutely had. <laughs> so thank you for that. And, uh, yeah, get back to work, dude, go mm-hmm. pick up your boat and we will see you down at Toledo Bend. Thank you for having Excellent me. Excellent job. dude.